Thanks. It's uh, it's exciting to be back here. It, it looks like finals week. Uh, <laughs> everyone's uh, more or less caffeinated. I saw some toothbrushes going around. Everyone's trying to stay, keep their hygiene up. <laughs> yeah. um, but but no, that that is the spirit of MIT. So I think you guys are all getting a good sense of that. Um, no, that's that's exactly kind of like the the energy that you want to feel here. Um, when we started Ministry of Supply, I think you probably heard a little bit um, from Amon, my co-founder, but you know, we, we started right out of the, the e-center and um, the environment was just like this. And it's very energetic, it's very collaborative, and um, no, it's just super exciting to see this continue to happen. Um, what I wanted to talk about today was kind of diving into our funding process. Um, yeah, you know, while I do tend to focus more on the branding and product for the company, um, Amon and I, you know, we share kind of the capacity of building the company. Um, uh, what Amon focuses on is tends to be more kind of the the financing and the marketing side of the company. I focus on the branding and the product development. Um, but together, we're really trying to create the the direction for the company. And what we found is that there is no you know kind of clear cut path for you know creating your organization. So. Um, and much the same way, there, nor, nor is there a clear path for fundraising. And that's what I want to talk about today, um, is, is how do you get that vision off the ground. Um, so I'll, I'll f I put in some slides earlier about just you know what ministry is about, but I'll kind of fly through these because I think you guys are all familiar. Uh, we'll keep you, try to keep you engaged uh, <laughs> this early in the morning. Um, but again, just, just a quick reminder, you know, Ministry of Supply, we're making a new category of clothing. We call it performance professional wear. It's all the comfort out of your athletic clothes, but designed for wear to work. And it's really built at this nexus of um, a new lifestyle where it's work-life integration. You guys are experiencing it right now where um, you need clothing that can kind of last you 16, 18 hours uh, for a day. Um, and, and it's this idea that, you know, many of us have experienced um, athletic fibers, you know, firsthand and, and seen how it actually allows us to perform better throughout our day. So um, I'll, I'll kind of run through this part because you guys are all aware of that. Um, but again, you know, from a market perspective, there's this huge opportunity that, that we've noticed, which is that the menswear market and the kind of the professional market um, are both growing quite quickly, but they're actually starting to merge together. And that's really where Ministry of Supply is kind of uh, built at. And because of that, it's created a lot of interest um, you know, in the capital markets, but people aren't quite sure how to fund something that fits right where this arrow is. Um, because there isn't a precedent for it. And so that's why you know, early on when you're creating a category, no one knows, are you guys a sportswear company? Are you guys a menswear company? Are you guys a tech company? We're, we're, we're somewhere in between all of that. And so um, there aren't necessarily analogs for, for what we're doing. And it makes it tough uh, initially. And so um, raising capital, uh, you kind of have to figure out your, your own way to do that. Um, so just kind of running to you, the, the meat of it, um, you know, where, where we are today with Ministry of Supply, um, we've been up and running for about five years now. We have, have a wide array of products, you know, suiting, pants. Um, we will soon have five stores across the country. Uh, we have three already. So the, the company has grown. Um, but to, to get to that, you know, we really think about there's two components. There's growth and then there's health. And so those two things are really what go into um, kind of how we look at, at the business. A lot of what you're seeing here is actually the, the health metrics, we think. So you know, it's, it's the idea of having a repeat rate. It's about having really strong margins. It's about the fact that we aren't paying for a lot of our marketing. Um, and so all of this contributes to um, a really healthy company, not just one that's growing. And when you put those two things together, it creates a really good funding story. So to kind of dive into the fundraising process, because I know that's what you guys are interested in, um, I'm going to start off with this kind of cheesy image. But it's, uh, I think most people have probably seen it before. It's this idea of, you know, this, we have this conception there's like a linear path to, to get somewhere. And a lot of times when we think of fundraising, we think it's, you know, we are going to make this pitch deck. We are going to go to Sand Hill Road, and we're going to pitch, you know, 15 VCs. And hopefully, one of them will, will invest, you know, $2 million in our, in our Series A. 
Uh, the reality is it's, it's, not, it's not always like that, and, and it's probably more like this. Um, <laughs> so, and, and, and this, this, is, this is what ours look like, so uh, there are definitely some companies who, who nailed you know, that, that one to the left, but um, I wanted to tell you a story of the meandering path, um, and it's one that I think, um, you know, if you're really committed to your business, your idea, um, even if you get turned down at Sand Hill Road, there are so many other ways to, to get the business off the ground, and so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, this is a snapshot of basically our, our funding, funding history. You know, we started about five years ago, um, right out of MIT. And um, the first round back in 2011, it was, we had some very initial, um, you know, product concepts. They were, you know, hand-sewn concepts, a couple samples from New York. But with that, we were able to go to investors and say, hey, we've, we've got an idea here, but not only do we have a business plan and the document, but we have a prototype. And especially in, in consumer goods, that goes a really, really long way um, for convincing people that, that there, there is some promise to the product and that, there's, um, that they're able to, to see the vision in, in some form, basically. And so with that, we were able to raise an angel round of $60,000 from MIT uh, alums. Uh, we were then able to build a small product line, do some small production. And this is something I think that's really, really important, is we started doing small batches of product, 50 units, 100 units a month of, of dress shirts. And we would sell it. And every month, we would go back and we'd take all the feedback from those, those first 50 customers, those, the next 100 customers, and reiterate the product and then s go out onto the market and sell it again. And so we did this for the course of a year between 2011 and 2012. And through that process, we were really able to hone the product market fit. And so what you'll see is, you know, come 2012, uh, you know, we were able to launch a, um, uh, well, won a angel round where we raised another $350,000 um, with that traction of having sold some of the product, but then also, we were able to launch a Kickstarter later that summer. And that Kickstarter was really built on, one, that we knew what the market was looking for because we had done all that iteration. And two, it was the fact that um, we already had you know, some small funding to help us kind of accelerate the, the early stage you know, product development. And so that was really important. After Kickstarter, um, it, we raised uh, $429,000. We were the most funded fashion project at the time. And it was something that was you know, proof positive that um, not only do people want the product, but it was actually a market validation. And that, that was probably the most important part of Kickstarter. Uh, we were then able to use that to go on to raise a convertible note round um, that ended up being about $1.1 million. Uh, after that, we ran another Kickstarter, again, more as you know, product pre-sales. Uh, followed by being able to get a bank line. Um, most of this was for uh, working capital needs. And then we raised a series seed round in 2014. This was uh, about 2.6 million, followed by a series seed two round. And what you can see here is there are a lot of different places we raised capital. Um, and, and so what I'm trying to get to is, you know, we've raised 8.5 million over the past five years, but it didn't come as one big tranche in 2012 and that we've been running on that since then. It's been these small bits here and there built on you know, getting to the next milestone, proving out what we need to do um, to get kind of that, that next point of market validation or prove a new growth channel and raise capital through that process. So what you see in the black is kind of the more traditional funding methods. You know, convertible debt, for example, which is actually somewhat new, um, but very common now in kind of early stage funding. And then you've got you know your Series C and uh, Series A, which would come out down later in the road, um, which is traditional equity rounds. But the blue is kind of the, for lack of better terms, non-traditional funding methods. Um, and that's really about you know what are the other ways, that particularly for a product business where you have working capital needs. Um, there's many other ways of you know, uh, of raising capital for the company. So here is what we call our, our, our capital toolbox. It's um, many of the ways that we use to, to fund the company. There's convertible debt, um, there's equity, crowdfunding, um, lines of credit, manufacturing payment terms. Um, so all five of these are all ones that we use together. Um, and they came in at, at various different points. And what's important to know is that oftentimes, I think people, um, 
you know, if you read TechCrunch, everyone's announcing how much they raised. And a lot of times people think that what you've raised is a mark of progress. Uh, but in many ways, there's many other tools that you can use and many tools that are non-dilutive. And I think that's the exciting part. Um, they're non-dilutive, they scale, and that's what we're going to get into. So. Um, for, for those of you who, who aren't aware of, of uh, convertible debt, it's been starting to be used somewhat recently um, as a, uh, a new tool for raising capital early on for a company when you're, the concept is very early on. You don't have a good way of evaluating the company. So what convertible debt is, is it basically says, I'm going to take a loan, has an interest rate, and has a maturity date, let's say 18 to 24 months. And then after that point, um, the investor has the option to either convert it to equity, or they can um, they can actually you know uh, pull back that loan you know with the, the interest rate. But in most cases, their intent is to invest as equity. So um, there's a couple different things to note here. Um, when there's an interest rate um, attached to it, so usually this is seven to eight percent. This is pretty common for a convertible note. Um, there's often what's called a discount to a, a future round. So that means because you are investing earlier on um, in the funding process, you'll get a discount to the future funding round. And so this basically means, let's say um, we raise a million dollars. And um, in two years from now, we raise at a $10 million valuation. That angel investor is going to have their debt convert at a $8 million valuation if it's a 20% discount. And so they're getting a, a little bit of a, a leg up because they invested earlier on. So it, it's, a, it's a way of not having to spend too much time focusing on the valuation early on. That said, sometimes investors will ask for what's called a cap. And that's basically, it's basically like they're saying it's a, it's a valuation. One of the other reasons people use convertible debt is it's way cheaper um, to use earlier on in the company. So um, just from a legal standpoint, you know, you're looking at something on the order of, let's say, five to $10,000 legally to do a convertible note, where it can be 25 to 30 to do uh, a convertible, I'm uh, sorry, uh, an equity round. So those, that's another reason why people opt for convertible debt. Um, but, you know, when, when you look at Ministry of Supply and kind of what our convertible debt rounds look like, uh, we had um, four tranches, three early on and one most recently. And what's been interesting is the types of investors who invest. It's a lot of angel investors. Um, but I wouldn't overlook angel investors. And one of the reasons why we found them to be so helpful is that, one, they're very committed to kind of the long vision of the company. Um, they're getting in early. They Most of our angel investors have... Uh, invested two to three times. So it's uh, they've been with the company for a while. They believe in the mission. Um, they're oftentimes our best customers, and that's something that it's a great way to source or, you know, early, cust uh, early investors is looking at who your best customers are. And it's a good way to um, you know, stay in touch with your, your, your customer base is, is through, um, you know, through the investors themselves. So um, you can get a range of check sizes, oftentimes 10 to all the way 700K. That's, that's what you know, we had at Ministry of Supply. You know, we've raised uh, 2.5 million on that uh, convertible debt. So that gives you a sense of uh, what convertible debt is. So again, it's basically a loan that turns to equity at some point, but it's really good for early stage companies. Um, then there's equity rounds. So this is probably what most people are familiar with. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The interest, accru yeah, yeah. Usually you'll negotiate that into your terms where the interest will accrue and then that just converts into equity later on. Yeah. Um, you know, looking at equity rounds, um, this is you know, pretty straightforward, translates into ownership of the company. Um, a lot of times it's done in the context of like institutional um, funds, whether it's a VC or you know, private equity or whatnot. Um, but we've, we've had actually our series seed rounds, which is like our equity rounds, done a different way. We actually went out to several family offices and at Ministry of Supply, you know, we're creating a brand and brands take seven to 10 years to build. And that was something that was really important for us is understanding that for a VC, because of, you know, the way their LPs are structured, their time horizon is they want to put this capital to work for five to seven years, 
and they want to see exits in that kind of time horizon, five to seven years. They want to see exits of their companies. And so sometimes there's a misalignment of what is the objective of the company and what's the objective of the fund. And so with family office, a lot, a lot of the times it's about um, long-term uh, wealth management. And so they're looking at a 10, 15 year time horizon. And so that's something that we found that was really helpful for us is that um, our investors who you know, come from these family offices are really looking for building a brand and are not looking for the kind of the quicker return. So definitely something to consider, you know, if you're on consumer tech or web tech, you may be fine with, with a VC, but if, you know, pharmaceuticals or if it's, you know, um, a brand or something that has a much longer time horizon, you should look at what is the, the kind of structure of the, the fund and what is their time horizon, just as much looking at you know, if you're raising from a VC, what stage are they in a fund? If it's their, you know, they're in their third year of deployment, they're going to start looking to pull back that money about, you know, three to four years. So definitely something to consider along the way. Um, one of the things I wanted to discuss in the context of equity um, was looking at, um, in, in, in particular, our space. So we're, we're a consumer products uh, brand. Uh, but if you look at how capital raised versus you know actual revenue created that is kind of the the best way to look at how efficiently does a brand use or a company use its, its capital so on the one hand you've got um, you know total capital raised over here versus annual revenue and what what you'll find is um, a lot of like web tech for example um, here's you know MongoDB house eventbrite um, they have a lot of capital they've used but the actual revenue is quite low. And so if you look on the other hand, when you start looking at consumer products, for example, it's a much lower you know, uh, a capital to revenue ratio. And that's something that has made um, you know, particular our space, you know, apparel brands very interesting for um, recent funds. Um, this is from CB Insights, um, a great source for um, you know, uh, analysis of the capital markets. But we've, we've found this to be actually a really helpful way of kind of positioning Ministry of Supply um, as an attractive investment for VCs because we're saying, hey, you know, if, if you put your dollars to work here, it, one, it's slightly lower risk and you're going to get a better kind of revenue return on that. So um, we're actually finding that VCs are moving a little bit away from, you know, these kind of long-term long kind of high capital needs to uh, consumer brands because of that. So um, definitely something to kind of look at when you position your company in the context of the capital markets. Um, in terms of valuation, this is oftentimes a question that comes up is, how do you guys value your company? Um, in the early stages, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, but as you start to have revenue, there are some analogs. And this is something that um, we use to kind of help position Ministry of Supply. We looked at some of our analogs. So, um, they, these are all retailers or brands, for example. And what we looked at was, um, one, what type of, what was their distribution? So were they direct to consumer? So like Warby Parker, Harry's, Everlane, for example. They're all DTC companies. Warby Parker is a great example. Um, you know, their attributes are you know, lower than market price, premium quality. And their run rate was $50 million in 2014. 100% year over year growth rate, enterprise value, 500 million. And then you're able to get a revenue multiple from that. And so by using this matrix, we're able to say, OK, Ministry of Supply has attributes that are similar to these other, these other companies. And it helped us kind of position what our valuation was for the company. Um, you know, on the other hand, we've got Lululemon, for example, which is a retailer. Uh, but you can see a slightly, slightly lower year-over-year um, -year growth, but obviously much higher uh, enterprise value. And you can see that. The revenue multiple is lower, but if you look at wholesale, for example, where the margin, one, the margins are much lower, and two, the growth rate is lower, that you're going to get a lower multiple there. So this, you know, by, by figuring out what is ministry of supply and what are our analogs doing and what are the valuations they have, this is a great way to kind of come up with our revenue multiple, which is oftentimes in consumer products the best way to value a company. Um, and another way of, of looking at it is looking at growth rate multiples, um, which is you know, looking at some other analogs for us. 
you know, Bonobos um, is a menswear brand that was born online. We looked at on an annual basis what was their revenue, what was their you know year over year growth rate, and uh, what this was important for was to figure out are we in the right conversation. So if you know, Bonobos is growing at a you know two point one per, uh, uh, two point one x uh, year over year growth rate, and MOS is about two x. We're in the the right conversation. You know, we're we're growing um, slightly faster than Lululemon was. Um, very similar to Warby Parker. This is the right conversation, and 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 it makes us, you know, kind of fit into the venture capital, uh, or uh, be attractive to, to venture capital. You know, if we were growing at let's say a twenty or thirty percent growth rate, uh, we may be more interesting to a growth equity firm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of it is public. Um, Privco is a great tool. Um, they uh, basically source a lot of kind of private company information, and they they they're able to aggregate some of this. That's what we use for that. Um, with Warby Parker, they publish like how many glasses they donate, and from that you can back out. Um, they have a one-to-one -one program, so you can back out how many glasses they've sold. And so we've used these analogs to help kind of position MLS in that way, um, but. Yes, it, it is difficult to find this information. You just have to glean from a lot of PR and uh, SEC filings and things like that. So <laughs> uh, there's a little bit of hacking that goes into it. <laughs> um, so that's, that's just you know, to give some context to um, equity financing and how you can go about creating the valuation for the company. So those two were a little bit more traditional. I want to go into the less traditional ones. Um, when we started the company, uh, about a year in, we launched on Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is a, a crowdfunding platform. Probably many of you are familiar with it. And it's a great tool for actually, a lot of times people think of it as, as you know, funding company operations. The way we look at it is more as pre-sales. And it's a way for us to, one, evaluate if there's demand, and two, kind of publicly show that there's market validation here. And so, after about a year of product development and doing these small, you know, production batches, we actually uh, launched our product on Kickstarter, set you know, four hundred, uh, a record four hundred thirty thousand dollars, and it was something where we could say, yeah, again, people don't just want the product; that there's actually a market being created here, and so that was a proof point for you know later funding rounds that we could point to, uh, one that this was something that didn't exist before, but also that we had already created you know almost a half million dollars worth of demand. Um, other things that are, are obviously great about crowdfunding is it gives you working capital. It helps you invert the cash conversion cycle, so you're not necessarily you know waiting around for uh, one uh, using your your equity investments to actually go into funding you know production. Um, that's probably not the, the most effective use of capital, and so uh, Kickstarter is a great tool for that. Um, it's also very helpful for PR because it's a very public way of saying, you know, this is the progress that that we've made, and this is a, an actual growing market. So, uh, in many cases, we've used um, Kickstarter, you know, early on as a way of saying, hey, there's actually a market being created here, and we were able to get more and more PR from that, and it was kind of a vicious cycle. Um, so, crowdfunding was incredibly helpful. Um, another one is lines of credit. I mean, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great question. So uh, one of the things we did was we constantly tracked basically the um, the message board that is attached to the Kickstarter, and we from that we could figure out what are the questions that people kept on asking. So um, our project, so we had a dress shirt that has a you know uh, a thermal cooling you know capability, and people didn't quite understand what face change materials were, and we kept we kept seeing these questions come up about it. So we actually said, you know what, we're actually going to go back to our video, we're gonna remake our video, rebuild it around this narrative, explain what are face change materials, and doing it in a very simple way. Um, we rewrote our campaign because of that, and we were able to iterate our messaging based on what was actually resonating with people. Um, we also looked at what the PR articles were saying, so like what was the headline, and using that to actually you know, rewrite some of the, the copy that, we, that, that was used um, on the site. And so that was a really helpful way of of you know figuring out what that product market fit is. Also, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you promoted the actual funding? The actual, yeah, yeah. So um, 
a couple, I guess a couple things. One from a, for Kickstarter, the stories that, that matter, people care about um, what is the problem you're solving? Uh, what is the product that you've created? But just as much with any of these crowdfunding platforms, people love the process. Um, you know, people go to Indiegogo or Kickstarter because you know, they're, they're early adopters, they're creators, and they want to see that inventive process. So exposing that is key. Um, but then just as much the people. So people process product and problem. Um, but the people is, um, you know, they want to know that this isn't just like some some brand that's creating this. They want to know it's people with that are, that are passionate about this problem, have experienced the problem firsthand. And so exposing those kind of four elements is what makes a really effective story. Um, in terms of getting the word out there, before we even launched the campaign, uh, we actually had uh, uh, several news articles lined up on launch date. And the reason that's important is uh, when you launch a, uh, a campaign on Kickstarter in particular, you really want some early momentum because the way their algorithms work is they track which product, uh, which projects are rising quickly. And from that, they will post the rising projects on their front page. They'll put it in their email. And what was interesting was actually half of our backers came from the Kickstarter platform itself. It wasn't necessarily people that we were directing to there. So it's really important to, to get that early momentum. Um, you know, from that we were able to uh, actually kind of you know iterate the messaging and kind of continue to uh, you know push forward uh, you know what messages were were, were resonating. Yeah, question. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, a lot of times people conflate Kickstarter with raising operational capital for their company, whereas you know we strictly look at that as pre-sales. Now, Kickstarter doesn't want people to say that. They don't want people to think it as a store, but effectively, um, that's kind of what it is. Um, but it's something where we think it's important to have the product in a really strong point before you launch it. You know, we had, we had done about 50 different prototypes. We had sold some product before then. So when we launched in Kickstarter, some of at least the product risk was mitigated. Admittedly, we hadn't figured out the scaling. So we had a supply chain that could do about um, 1,000 shirts a month. We had to get to 8,000 shirts a month. So scaling that was challenging. And that's where a lot of Kickstarters fail. Um, but understanding you know, and having a, a plan for scaling your production is key before going to your, your, your Kickstarter. Yes, in the back, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 It's um. If you if you look at like that campaign, it goes like this, this, and that. There's there's three inflection. There's two inflection points. One was the, the first week we got to um a point where we became the most funded fashion fashion projects. So we beat one that was there at like 200K. And from that, we started getting a lot of press that helped kind of accelerate us to that next phase. And then the next, the one after that was, we had a slew of Forbes articles, TechCrunch articles, um, that kind of pushed us in that last, like I think it was like three or four days actually. Um, and so there's definitely something to be said about there being a vicious cycle of momentum. And that's why you want to seed it uh, really early on so you can push yourself to the top of the front page of Kickstarter. Uh, yeah, yeah. Getting back to the digital um, how, how did you decide how much to raise at this point? Yeah. So our, uh, our initial funding goal was $100,000. or th It was $30,000, but kind of internally our goal was $100,000. Um, that was based on like a minimum production run that we had for our fabric. Um, and then internally we had like an annual goal of we wanted to do 100000 So we wanted to see if we could cover that through that year's production. Um, but I mean, this by by all means, you know, exceeded our expectations there. And kind of what I was saying earlier was we didn't have a supply chain that could handle that, and that was probably one of our biggest challenges that whole year. Uh, we actually we took pre-sales for another month after Kickstarter, but then we actually shut down our site for sales for about four months because we were just playing catch up, and that's often a challenge that a lot of crowdfunded campaigns have. Um, something to be wary of, but uh, we launched a second campaign and we were actually able to apply a lot of our learnings from our first one to that. And so one of the ones was um, iterating you know, our messaging to was having a production uh, supply chain that could scale um, and then also having kind of realistic goals, yeah. Any other questions on crowdfunding? 
$10. Yeah, yeah. So, once, didn't it occur to you that uh, maybe this offer is, you know, having something? So, even if it is, you know, if you, if you charge from Amazon as $1, yeah. and just offer a thank you message, yeah. I mean, just tell me your, your thoughts about it. Yeah. Uh, did you target a specific customer which could, uh, which could at least support $10, or you didn't want, you know, more money? Um, no, it's it's a great point. You know, um, we 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 didn't have like a kind of the the small kind of like emotional donation point, but um, that was very much like our, our ten dollar one. We we gave out like a a little notebook with that. I think um, I think you bring up a great point, which is how do you capitalize on excitement even if someone's not ready to purchase the the product? And what's great about that is you can get people into your your flow you'll get the email list and that's definitely that's a, that's a great point um, but when we th we thought about kind of our backer levels we had a $25 backer level that someone would get one of our t-shirts um, we had a $95 backer level where someone would get um, just one of our dress shirts and then actually a $150 one and that was what was interesting was people were buying our un a couple of our undershirts and dress shirts and what we found through that behavior was that um, People were interested not just in the product itself, but our whole concept, um, and that actually helped us educate our product roadmap, where we're really trying to create a system of products that work together, just as much as the kind of the individual shirts themselves. So, and for example, I was to you know pledge ten dollars for yeah, yeah. this thing. How much uh, value were, were you giving back? I mean, what, 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 how much was the product? Oh, product. I, you know, I'd say about like you know maybe fifty percent. You know, it was. It was a small mailer, but uh, but there's definitely value for someone being in your 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 customer chain, basically. Yeah. And you kept this steady across the uh, you know different uh, rewards. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, yeah. So um, the challenge was for us in Italy was the first production round. We didn't realize the cost of scaling production, and so our margins suffered you know, quite a bit, and we we broke even on the campaign, and I think that's where a lot of Kickstarters, they, had, you know, don't, they either uh, undersell their product or they don't necessarily know what the margins are going into the production. So that was something that was challenging for us. And so the second time around, we had a much better understanding what the true costs were, true costs of fulfillment. And that's actually one of the biggest things that kind of eat into to people's margins that they're not considering early on. Any others? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, no, no, uh, through our, our own our own site, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, fashion, it generally is the customer perception, at least in the part of the world that I come from, yeah. that I should have some discount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Is that a challenge for you? Uh, for, so for Kickstarter, I think the, the way it's positioned often is um, these people are early adopters, so they're, they're getting a, a discount more so because they're believing the product. There is some slight you know, product risk here that it won't get delivered. Um, but we've actually generally tried to move away from you know, large discounting other than, what's, what's our discount code right now? It's uh, sleep, is sleep is for the week. Yeah, yeah. So we have a discount code that's going on right now. Uh, but you know, generally speaking, we, um, we try to make sure that the value that we're conveying to our customers um, is one that you know, they're, they're willing to pay for. And we're not trying to use discounts to bring people over the hump. Um, so you know, up until somewhat recently, we've only used um, discounts for first-time customer acquisition. Whereas if you look at the traditional retail industry, um, what oftentimes happens, it's very seasonal. And they plan selling 50% of the product at, at regular price and 50% actually at discount. So uh, we're trying to move away from that because it's not sustainable. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So to do the Kickstarter, um, you know, it costs us about you know ten k to do a, you know, a lot of the production of the video and the kind of our, our planning purposes. Um, but Kickstarter does take uh, seven and a half percent. Kickstarter takes a, a five percent cut, and then there's uh, Amazon payments on top of that. So that that goes off the top, and that's something one people need to consider is like all these things kind of eat into your margins. Um, I mentioned fulfillment that you know took a, a quite a uh, fair amount, um, and you so you were saying about the the cost of the other, round. the other rounds. Um, uh, this round, in terms of each, so we had two equity rounds that went into this. 
Um, the first one costs about 30K in legal fees. The second one is about 50K. It, a lot of it depends on surely how much back and forth there is with your investors. And so as much as possible, what we've tried to do, and that's a great point, is um, to focus on negotiating the terms with one investor and really just make it so that everyone else after that kind of has to be in or out, yeah. Um, because you don't want to go back and forth. Because every time you renegotiate the terms with one investor, you have to give those same terms to everyone else. And so <laughs> it just costs more and more, yeah. 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 Right. So how do I think uh, no, it's it's a good point. Um, you know, when you're raising angel capital, you end up getting these small checks, and you have you know easily you know, 15, 20 people on the cap table. Um, you know, I I, I think uh, it's about you know if, if you're not able to get you know VC capital early on, at the end of the day, it's like you've got to do what you have to do to get to get the get the company off the ground, and so. Uh, one of the things uh, we've realized is we used to make a lot of decisions um, thinking about what was going to make us attractive for VC later on. And what we found was that, you know, actually, we might, like, a, a brand actually isn't the best thing for, for VC in general. It's, you know, these family offices and things like that. And so once we were able to say, you know, we're not going to structure our company around following a traditional kind of Series A route, um, it actually gave us a lot more freedom to focus on what was most effective for building a product business and a, and a fashion brand. So um, I, I think that was definitely something we struggled with, was constantly thinking about what is going to be attractive to VCs. And instead, we should be focusing on you know, what is going to move the business forward. Yeah. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of quickly go through to the next two elements. I mean, lines of credit are, are pretty um, you know, common. But I'll just kind of quickly go through some of the caveats or things that we've learned through the process is uh, it's attractive because it's non-dilutive, um, but just just be aware that there are oftentimes a lot of capital restrictions that go with that. Um, so we've raised uh, or uh, raised about seven hundred fifty thousand um, dollars of working capital through that. There's different different you know restrictions um, depending on you know, how you're using that debt. If you're using it for working capital, your interest rate is much lower. Um, if it's closer to the venture debt and you're actually funding operations, um, it can be you know north of 20%. So um, in, in our case, we wanted a lower interest rate, and so it came with many covenants. And um, one of those is called like an automated quick ratio. Basically means it's a ratio of your uh, accounts and receivables to cash on hand. And what that means is for a company that is um, selling to wholesalers or you know kind of retailers, it's a way of saying that there's actually demand here, and we're you know it's a it's a ratio between the demand and the, the cash you have on hand. Um, that one is is restricting, and one of the things we realized is that wasn't a good representative of what our business did. Um, we're a direct consumer brand; we don't have a lot of wholesale accounts, so our accounts receivable is, is quite low. Um, so we renegotiated our terms the second time around, um, and said have a EBITDA max. Uh, or EBIT max, that basically means there's a maximum loss we can have on a monthly and quarterly basis. Um, but again, it's, it, it's something where it starts to restrict how you use capital over the year. Um, and I guess you have to consider, like, is that you know, 750K that you get, is it actually helping you or is it hurting you? Um, generally speaking, you know, because we're a product business, we, we need that working capital. But um, you know, if, if you don't have a lot of working capital needs early on, the debt may not make sense. Um, and another thing to consider is how it looks on the books for you know, future funding rounds is you know, if you have a lot of debt, um, at some point it's not going to be, be attractive um, to investors. So that's definitely something to, to be aware of. Um, the final one I wanted to talk about was manufacturing payment terms. And this is actually something that I think a lot of people forget, it's, you know, and, and it's incredibly important for a, um, a consumer products business or any, any pro business where you have those kind of capital needs. Um, one of the things is it's a way of working with your manufacturers, building a relationship where they're able to mitigate your working capital needs by giving you payment terms. So it helps shorten your cash conversion cycle. Um, it also, it's a great way of getting your partners to invest in the company, basically. Um, so uh, two examples, we have two suppliers, one of our fabric, two of our fabric mills. Um, they actually um, give us 60-day payment terms. And 
what we've learned from that is that we're actually able to invert our cache conversion cycle. So um, basically, once the product leaves the factory, we have 60 days. And what we found is interesting is it's cheaper for us to actually airship our product than put it on the boat. The reason being that we're able to get about 20 extra days of selling time back into our, our, our cash cycle. So that's more important for us is being able to sell the product. So we actually airship our product um, because it shortens that cash conversion cycle. And uh, it's a one way that we've been able to actually give equity. We've, we've given some equity along with the payment terms to our, our, uh, our factories. And it just gets them so much more bought in. They're invested in your success. And one of the great things about these, these payment terms is they are premised on usually having like a one to two year relationship where they can see the growth trajectory. Um, it often requires some kind of commitment of production schedule with them. But it scales with the business. And that's something that most of these other capital means I don't do. Um, so you know, in two years from now, when we have cogs of, let's say, you know, five to ten million a year, that that's actually going to be um, covered through the same agreement. So it's something that's really helpful. Um, a couple things is there's usually like a ten percent APR and some financing fee associated with it. But um, this has actually been something that we've been working on for the past um, year. Now that we've built these relationships, and it's something that's really, really impactful. So this is just a uh, an example of kind of what our cash conversion cycle looked like in 2015 versus 2016. Um, basically, the gray bars uh, show you know, what is the, the inventory that, that, we're, that we have and how it uh, depreciates blue lines cash. Um, and you can see that we're going into a deficit you know, right when the, the PO, or when, right when the product leaves the factory and we were having to pay for product um, before we'd actually be able to sell it. But here, we're actually able to get the inventory on hand and we are, we're not paying for the product, so the cash conversion cycle actually gives us positive working capital um, if we're able to sell more than half of our product. So you know, our gross margins are about on the product is about 65%. So if we're able to sell 35% of our inventory by, um, so let's say you know that's 20 days into the cycle, that's one month into our payment terms, we actually have 60 days to start selling product, and that actually gives us more capital to you know, fund our marketing, for example. And so this was something that, this is probably more important than, than raising a million dollars or two million dollars for us was actually getting these payment terms, because that unlocked the business. Um, and this is something that, that we think was incredibly, incredibly important. And it leaves me on the last note, which is the bonus and last one is, the, the, the best way to fund your business is, is sell product. And I think it goes without saying, but I think um, uh, it was something that one of our investors, he, he wrote on our first check, sell, sell, sell shirts. And every, every time he you know, does a new investment, it always says, you know, sell shirts. And the, the thing we've learned is, you know, I, uh, my background's like an engineer and designer, and I, I, I generally want to you know, perfect the product, but at the end of the day, it's about getting product out the door and, and selling it, and that is what's going to allow you to kind of move the business forward. So it's, it's something where you, you, know, you heard early on where we're doing these small production batches. It was a way for us to prove progress, you know, get awareness, and um, selling product is kind of the ultimate way is eventually you want to become profitable. And by focusing on that as your number one goal of funding the business, um, you'll create something that's sustainable. Um, so with that, I'll just kind of leave it with a summary slide. But if there's any other questions, happy to talk through them. Yeah. Definitely. I think um, one of the ones we found that was really helpful is you know this convertible debt. You'll be able to raise some amount on a business plan, but um, again, kind of going to that last slide of how fast can you get to market validation or some kind of proof of, of concept, that was the most effective point for us to start moving into actually raising capital, um, is, is, is have product, um, have a prototype, have something that kind of shows, that one, you have a concept that solves a problem and that people are willing to pay for it. Um, and that's probably the, the fastest way to kind of, you'll, you'll, ha you'll have some vision of what's the final product gonna look like, but if you can kind of break it into these small chunks. You know, we had this vision of creating a, a whole outfit, but we wanted to start with shirts and focus on that early on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, 
Yeah. How do you assess their 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 capability? Yeah. Because yes, to continue to grow agility and then to catch up with the growth. Growth. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great point. So, one of the things we were <coughs> learning early on, um, kind of goes back to like that that, that Kickstarter challenge we had was it was really hard for us to scale production early on, and we were manufacturing um, we were manufacturing domestically and. The thing was, we didn't have what was called finished goods purchasing. So um, it meant that to make a shirt, we were buying the buttons, we were buying the hang tags, we were buying the fabric. We were paying a supplier to cut the fabric, a supplier for the fabric itself, uh, a supplier to actually cut and sew it. We were paying 14 POs to create a dress shirt. And one, from a financing standpoint, that's a huge nightmare. Two, there's a lot of inventory risk that comes with that. like. You need to make a thousand shirts, but you have to buy ten thousand buttons. Uh, I know these sounds like simple things, but yeah, all of a sudden, all this inventory builds up, and so um, we were finding that there was no way that we could scale our, our product line by having to place all these, these micro POs. So we moved to what's called finished goods purchasing, and what that means is we give the design of our product to our supplier. So we have um, one company called Syntex, another one called Tore. Um, they're, one's in Japan, one's in Taiwan, and they've been amazing partners for us. And what they've done is they've said, okay, one, we're fabric a supplier, so we're, we're able to supply the fabric for you, but we can also manage the entire production of your product. So we'll work with the cut and sew facility, we'll source all your trims, and you'll just pay one price for the product. And the great thing about it is that it's mitigated so much of the risk for us because in many cases, you know, we're able to do bulk buying of um, buttons or fabric with another brand, and they're able to kind of do that in the background with, without you know us needing to know about it. But we can get a much much better rate because we're buying in bulk with, with another company. Um, and the second part is they're the ones who are ultimately extending those 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 payment terms, right? And so instead of having to get 60-day terms with your button supplier, but only 30-day terms with your fabric supplier, we're able to aggregate all of that and it makes this financing so much simpler. So that was a huge change for us, was moving from kind of multiple POs to single PO placement. But in the end, is it more expensive for you to manufacture in one shop than in one it's, it's interesting, like, um, we actually find that w w you'd, think, you'd think it would, would be, but because they're aggregating all of that demand, um, they're able to get one be better pricing, and two, um, the, we wouldn't be able to get that kind of payment terms with the smaller uh, PO. So on the whole, it ends up being cheaper to pay to do the, the the final PO. How did you find them? Um, a lot of it was actually through our um, advisors. So um, actually, a mentor for the EDP program here, Tetsuya Ohara. He's a uh, director of advanced research at Patagonia. He put us in touch with kind of their, their you know, key manufacturers, and um, it was a great way to understand that our biggest challenges, in some ways, wasn't the product; it was how to make it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. It's quite personal question. Yeah. Yeah, so um, you know, early on, um, we put in some of our own capital, mostly for, for living expenses, living off credit cards. Um, uh, and then kind of later on in the business, um, put in some capital in a kind of a more recent round. But it's something where, uh, it, I mean, it wasn't a significant amount. We were coming out of college or you know, business school. And, but it was more of a gesture of, we're putting our own money on the line here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you guys decided how to do it? Yeah, um, the, splitting equity uh, you know, between you know, team members is obviously <laughs> challenging. Uh, I think the, the biggest feedback that, that we got was um, obviously like the simple ones of make sure you're on investing terms, but you'd be surprised at like how many companies early on um, you know don't don't have cliffs, don't have you know four year vesting terms. Um, I've heard a lot of you know friends companies kind of go through these challenges. So that's the number one part: incorporate early. Um, but in terms of splitting up equity, the the best feedback we got was actually don't split it evenly. Um, that, that's probably you know, Acknowledge that there are differences, and there's other ways of recognizing each other. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, there's different ways of acknowledging risk, of uh, uh, acknowledging expertise, and then acknowledging kind of um, resources that one brings to the table. So um, the way we did it is 
there was an article we found on like, I don't know, this was like TechCrunch or something like that, maybe five years ago, of actually a point system, and it's a matrix of 10 criteria, and you know, you give each founder, you know, a different number of points, and you know, the reality is it was an objective way for us to divvy it up, and at the end of the day we said, the agreement was, do we believe in the process? Whatever the outcome is, we're gonna go ahead with that, and that's what we did, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a way of kind of making a little bit less of an emotional decision, but we found that process to be quite helpful, yeah. Christian, did yeah. you, as a founder, did you have a salary in the beginning? Uh, from which point you From which point, yeah, yeah. Uh, so when we started, uh, we, did, we, didn't, we didn't take salary for that the six, first six months. Um, I was uh, living out of a, we had a MIT fraternity that was, was shut down actually, and we were, had our office there and lived in the walk-in closet for the first six months, so it was one of those things. Uh, uh, Bill Allett gave us some, some office space also here at the E-Center. Uh, actually, the, the, the new Sloan building over here, uh, it was being renovated and they gave basically the Beehive, which is a bunch of startups, some, some remained office space and it was a kind of, it was very much like this. It was a bunch of people just kind of hacking on projects, but it was a great kind of, uh, kind of grubby environment. We didn't start paying ourselves until about a year into the business. Yeah. So it was what, which financing was? Uh, it was the second convertible note. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that was something where like, you know, here we got to the point where we could literally just pay for you know, food and whatnot, but you know, coming to this stage, we said, okay, now that we're scaling the business, we proved out um, that there is demand, and that's when we were able to kind of take salaries. Um, but you know, everyone's got you know kind of you know different stages of life, and obviously coming out of college, it's a lot easier to, to live that lifestyle. But um, you know, for for one of the things I would suggest is you can see here that there are natural progression points and milestones, and um, one of the things we said was, you know, student loans kick in in six months after graduation. We want to be selling product by then because ultimately that's a proof point for us. And so I think it, it gets, you know, the, there was a question of like, wh where do you start? And I think breaking it down to these smaller bits and saying, you know, I just need to make it to through the six month mark and prove out whether it, we're going to make it or not. That's a great place to say, okay, is, the, is, there, is there a business here? And, and if there's an, there isn't, then there's an easy way out, I guess. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's it's definitely a challenge. I mean, we 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 have um, a single. Uh, we have two manufacturing partners. We have multiple suppliers within that that chain. So that's one we have at least uh, reducing the manufacturing risk. But in terms of IP, one of the things we realized was at the end of the day. Um, particular consumer goods uh, and, and apparel in general, uh, IP is largely overlooked. I mean, you look at, um, you know, bags, tents, clothing, everything's made in the same factories. And so as soon as you kind of get past that, it actually unlocks a lot of capabilities and kind of part partnerships that you can have with manufacturers. Um, I think sometimes <coughs> IP gets in the way of creating good partnership. and. Um, Yes, there's always the possibility that they could go off and sell our product to someone else, but um, what we've realized is that we're a fashion brand, and at the end of the day, the value that we're creating is as a brand, um, just as much as it is the product itself. Any others? I think we're wrapping up on time, yeah. Thanks, thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah. <laughs>